This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. All right, welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Jonathan Rausch, who is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and also the author of, of many books. Um, most recently, this book, The Constitution of Knowledge, uh, A Defense of Truth, uh, but also uh, many other books, including some I have right here. One, this one's called The, the Happiness Curve, uh, Why Life Gets Better After 50. Uh, this one, uh, I, it's hard to imagine, it's hard to believe this came out as long ago as it did. Um, kindly uh, inquisitors, uh, but also books, um, political realism, denial, uh, gay marriage, government's end, and uh, the out nation. Um, welcome, Jonathan. Happy to be here. So the Constitution of Knowledge, this is, I, I, I kind of find it hard to believe that this book has not been written before because i think that the thesis the 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 architecture of the book is really is really fantastic what you do is you you highlight how you know we live in these kind of three liberal orders we've got the uh, order of the marketplace we, we've got the 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 political order which is underwritten by the constitution here in the united states and then we have this order of uh pursuit of truth and knowledge, right, which of which science and journalism are a big part. Um, and, and all of them are kind of emergent systems that are organized in order to um, kind of collect and collate the dispersed efforts of many, many individuals into some, some commons that we can all kind of uh, benefit from. Uh, and you know, I've in, in, I teach a course on, on behavioral finance, and the kind of thrust of the course is that, you know, everybody's biased, but if those biases are organized properly, if they're channeled properly, then, you know, we get uh, kind of prices in the marketplace that are, you know, more or less, more or less accurate. And, and, I, and I would analogize this to the insight that Smith had with respect to markets in general, and that Hamilton had, uh, and Madison had with respect to kind of uh, political institutions. And, and I think that you draw those parallels very, very powerfully when you talk about this constitution of, of knowledge. So, so if, if kind of self-interest is the thing that we need to kind of harness in the world of markets, and if kind of ambition is the thing that we need to harness in the service of politics, what is it that we're, we're harnessing? Uh, what is what vice is it that we're kind of harnessing in the pursuit of knowledge? Is it is it is it bias? Right? Is it? I mean, you you talk about kind of confirmation bias and conformity bias. Is is bias kind of the the engine that that drives the pursuit of of knowledge? Right? What what is this? What is the vice that we're trying to kind of corral in order to to create knowledge? What a great question, and what a what a smart introduction. Uh, yeah, it's a theory. Thesis, going back to my book, Kindly Inquisitors, now unbelievably 28 years old, that we have three big liberal social systems. One is the one we use for politics. The second is for markets. The third is for ideas. And they all substitute impersonal or depersonalized rules and, um, and, and distributed coordination for centralized rules and top-down coordination. And... Yeah, they're all realistic about human needs, wants, potentials, and, and vices. And in the constitution of knowledge, I think I would say that the vice, if it is a vice, or the, the human trait, maybe, is um, status. We can get status in a lot of ways. One is by persuading other people that we're right or alternatively putting ourselves in a dominant position so that we can force them to say that we're right. And one way to do that is to become a prince or potentate or a politburo or priest and kill or ostracize the people who don't agree with you about, for example, who God is or what's the cause of the disease that's hurting our children. Another way to do it is to found a sect or a cult and appeal to people and gain followers and become a mystery religion who are a cult of personality. And the problem with both of those methods is that they're absolutely terrible for organizing society, finding truth, or keeping the peace. We tried them for 200,000 years. The result was obscuritism and ignorance and warfare and oppression. 
So along come some people around the same time as Adam Smith and James Madison. And indeed, they often knew each other who said, well, wait a minute, there's a better way to do it. Let's turn over the truth-seeking business to a lot of individuals and let's wire it up so that the way you achieve status is by showing other people that you're right. And, and showing them you're right doesn't mean forcible conversions. It doesn't mean appeal to personal characteristics like you know religion or revelation. It means using arguments and evidence that anyone else can and should and must look at. And only when you persuade all these other people that you're right, do you get status. And that's why Greg LeBlanc is where he is right now, right? He's managed to persuade some people that he's done some good academic work and that's given him some status in the academic community. I assume. <laughs> I don't <laughs> well, know you are. Well, might be overstating the case, right? But, um, but look, uh, people who think that, um, you know, a good uh, economy is going to grow out of untrammeled competition, right? Just, you know, laissez-faire, free for all. I mean, yeah, there are some people like this, I guess some extreme kind of kind of libertarians, but, but they, you know, they're, they're not, nobody takes them seriously because they haven't really thought this through very carefully. And, and you know, there might be some crazy folks who think, that if you just have total anarchy, that somehow a livable world will, will emerge from it. But again, those people are are kind of fringe and nobody really takes them seriously. But when it comes to the, the world of ideas, right, you know, it's kind of a mainstream idea that if you just have a, a, a marketplace for ideas that's like unregulated in any way or, you know, unstructured in any way, that, that somehow the truth and is going to emerge. Um, why is that idea not as kind of marginalized as the other two, right? Why, why do people still, and you, you refer to them as kind of techno utopians, but I, I think this idea goes, goes back even, even further. And it, and it seems to be, you know, a lot of intelligent people might, yeah, might yeah. subscribe to It goes back a long one. time. If yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of the marketplace of ideas, simile or metaphor, uh, I use it. But it's, it's radically incomplete, and at some point it becomes so incomplete that it's misleading. And the way it's misleading is when institutions in society work well, they become invisible. We don't even think about them. They just surround us. They shape us. They make us who we are. We just take for granted we're going to school and then maybe go to college or maybe we join the scouts or a church. There's part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And for a very long time, the constitution of knowledge worked so well that we assumed all you need is free speech and the rest takes care of itself. What we forgot were all of the mediating institutions and professionals and norms and standards and rules that are required to make this thing work. And there are a lot of them and they are hard to follow and they take centuries to develop and years of people's lives to acculturate. This is everything from mastering a subject in graduate school to peer review in my branch of the truth-seeking industry, journalism. It's learning how to check stories, um, how to write, how to edit, how to be edited, passing those things along to the next generation. Lawyers go through years of training. People at government agencies that gather statistics or intelligence do the same. And all of these organizations are about inculcating a whole lot of norms about what you do if you want to make truth, right? If, if, if you want to get something in a biology textbook, it's no good just to say, God told me, or this is what I think. You're going to have to go through years, if not decades, of rigorous work in the lab, um, in journals. You're going to have to persuade a lot of people, respond to a lot of arguments, do that in certain ways. You know, you can't start your article with Gregory, you ignorant slut. Um, and so when those things work, we take them for granted. We just say, well, free speech is all you need. Recently, we've seen attacks on all these things. And that's why I thought it was so important to write a book called The Constitution of Knowledge, which surfaces the structures that we need in order to convert contention into facts, into knowledge. Right. And so, you know, the political constitution has um, kind of institutions that are attached to it or maybe an extension of it. And I think about the bar, for instance, right? So, the, you know, the bar is, is these are lawyers. They're not employees of the state. Uh, they have their own kind of, kind of rules that they have developed. And, and I always think of the bar as, as an extension of the, the constitution, right? And if lawyers didn't have 
kind of ethical guidelines and ethical rules and that they could just go into court and lie or whatever, then the whole system would kind of crumble. Um, and I always thought that journalists had sort of a, a similar, um, they, they operate in a similar fashion, but, but without any kind of real kind of sanction, right? It was, it was just sort of, it was always a mystery to me how journalists were able to maintain this uh, sense of integrity uh, for as long as they had to the extent that they did without any real mechanism for, for, for punishing uh, violators, right? I mean, you can, you can disbar someone and make sure that they'll never be able to, you know, litigate again. Uh, but, but for a journalist, I mean, the only sanction is that they have to go off and start their own, you know, journal, right? So how, how does, how did journalism for so long maintain a sense of, of professionalism purely based on voluntary norms? Well, it's not as pure as all that. Um, in fact, it's an interesting story because in the 19th century, American journalism was, you know, a cesspool of hyperpartisanship and fake news. H. L. Mencken, the greatest American journalist of his era, writes in his memoirs about how he and the other Baltimore reporters at the other newspapers would get together over drinks and fabricate stories, coordinate fabricated stories for the next day's paper. And since they all reported the same thing, everyone assumed it was true. And he thought this was hilarious. Mm -hmm. So how do we get out of that? Well, actually not that different from law or science. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, some people decide that enough is enough. They're starting to lose readers and credibility. The American Society of Newspaper Editors forms. First thing it does is formulate some rules and standards for journalists, things that seem obvious now, like you know, check your facts, run corrections, be accurate, give people a chance to respond. Someone had to think of those things. Meanwhile, we start to see the uh, opening of journalism schools at universities in the early 20th century, and they start training people and inculcating those norms. And in the same period, we start to see the rise of journalism prizes. The Pulitzer is the biggest one, but there are lots of others. And these begin to acculturate people. If you want to get ahead, if you want status, then you want to have a big story. You want to get it right. Um, it's going to have to stand up to some scrutiny. And it really only takes a few decades before you go from the world of yellow journalism to the world of Edward R. Murrow. And it's not all that different from academia or law. Very few people in law are, are disbarred. Uh, some, I think, deserve to be. Sidney Powell, for example, and Rudy Giuliani went to court and lied about the election. But the real sanction there is that judges are going to look askance at you. Other lawyers aren't going to want to work with you. Your reputation will be damaged. Same in academia. People do get defenestrated for, for cheating, you know, if they make up data. But I think the, the biggest deterrence to that kind of behavior is that you want the respect and credibility of your professional peers. So what I call the reality-based community, that's the... The industries, the sectors that adhere to the constitution of knowledge, there, there are four big ones. One is academia, science, and research. The second is journalism. The third is law. The fourth is government. So what they have in common is that they're basically professional networks. Finding truth is really hard, takes a lot of training, a lot of skill, a lot of knowledge. Mostly professionals do it. And you got to set things up so the way to get the respect of other professionals is to follow the rules and get it right. So it seems like, I mean, the, this brief shining moment where journalism seemed to be, and I don't know whether this is, maybe this is like a, um, you know, uh, rose tinted lenses, but I think a lot of people point to this brief period where journalism seemed to, you know, work in this way, was really the exception rather than the rule. And, and the, the 19th century uh, regime is really kind of more the, the, the default regime and, and, you know, the marketplace where you pursue whatever sells and whatever clicks and whatever people buy, that, that seems to be, um, you know, the, the natural state of things. Um, and, and so now it seems like we're, we're going back to that world. Um, how, why would anybody value the, the prestige and status of respect from a group of journalists when there's, uh, so much more money to be made potentially by, you know, by ignoring the respect of that community? And, and if you could create another community, like an epistemic secession community that you talk about and, and create your own status hierarchy in the separate community, why would you, why would anybody want to, you know, stick within this, this mainstream community? 
Well, there, there are a lot of people who care about truth and finding truth and advancing knowledge and doing the right thing. And in fact, most of the fields in the reality-based community don't pay all that much and thus don't tend to attract the people who want to make millions of dollars a year being a television pundit who pontificates about the Seth Rich conspiracy. Um, there is a, a growing... A growing bifurcation in American journalism, especially with conservative media, Fox News commentators and, and all of that, but also online. You do see an ecosystem in which people are being rewarded for celebrity, for making stuff up or getting things wrong, as, as long as it sells, as long as it moves the clicks. That is nothing new. We've always seen that in journalism. For a long time, we called it the gutter press. Um, snobbishly enough, but well, it actually played the, a role the, in journalism. The, the, the National Enquirer, <clears throat> right? I mean, the, you yeah. know, the, those things, my, my newspaper favorite tabloids. The News of the World, I think, wasn't, I think they're the ones who had the recurring stories about the space alien mm -hmm. back in the 80s and 90s, and, and the Bat Boy, and the Three-Headed Child, and, and, um, and all of that. So that stuff was always there, and it always will be. The the question is, can you have a thriving, reasonably well-funded and honest journalistic establishment that follows the conventional rules of journalism? Because it turns out a lot of people do want to know what's true. A lot of people don't like being in an epistemically manipulated environment, you know, where where what they're actually told turns out not to be reliable and, and can, in fact, often harm them. So the big challenge right now is keeping a business model going for the kind of journalism that is, it's still alive. It's its not financially well. Everyone's struggling to figure out how to pay the bills in reality-based journalism. But fortunately, the ethic is still very much alive. And I meet, I'll tell you, do you, do you prefer Gregory or Greg? I should have asked hours Greg's, ago. Greg's fine. Greg's fine. Greg, yeah, okay. Greg, I am, I am heartened and a bit surprised by the number of talented, dedicated young people who come to me wanting to enter journalism for the exact same reasons that I wanted to. They're curious, they want to figure stuff out, they want to tell good stories, and they want to find truth. They still want to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, but there does seem to be a, a conflict between, say, you know, truth and, and, and utility, right? So, you know, if you have a utilitarian view, then you know, you're interested in harm reduction, you're interested in kind of welfare maximization. And, and there's no real reason why, you know, knowledge of the truth or pursuit of the truth would align with, you know, maximizing utility or, or reducing harm. Right. So, so, you know, we, I think, certainly among the social science scientists, their normative principle is one that's, you know, utilitarian at, at the end of the day. Um, and so how, how do you resolve that, that tension, right? I mean, I think this came out a lot in, in the way in which journalists covered the coronavirus crisis, right? Where, you know, you have to think carefully about what it is that you publish because you're concerned that people might misinterpret what you're writing, right? They might misinterpret, uh, you know, if you, if you entertain the possibility, right, of, of some viewpoint that might, people might grapple on, grasp onto, and then go and do things that are harmful to themselves and others, right? I mean, how much do you have to think about uh, the, the kind of consequences of, of what it is that, that's published, right? You certainly don't want to induce panic, right? We don't want to shout fire in a, in a, in a theater, right? We want a more orderly exit, even if there is a fire. So, so, so do journalists have to have a journalistic ethic that is in competition with the, the pursuit of the truth, namely the impact that their journalism has on, on the world? Oh, well, sure. Everyone thinks about impact on the world. That's what editors are paid to do. And a, a great organization with well-trained people and a sense of responsibility to their communities will have conversations about... Um, how much of what you don't do you publish? Because you never publish quite all of it. Um, and if someone in the government calls you up and says that if you print A, B, or C, it's going to destroy our chances of assassinating Osama bin Laden, that's going to carry mm -hmm. a lot of weight in the newsroom. I, I, was, I came up in a journalistic environment. 
I'm kind of in the academic world now, but, but I'm trained as a journalist. And the first thing we learn is that we have a responsibility to our community. We're, we're there to serve them. And, but we're also there to serve the truth. And that's the job of editors. Editors are the secret technology, the, the um, secret sauce of journalism. And the, the reason that mainstream journalism is still so much more reliable and so much more grown up than social media is editors, human beings who sit mm -hmm. there and look at stuff and ask reporters and other people, have you checked this? What have you done to check it? Let me see your notes. Uh, and then they think about, so is, is the story ripe? What are the mm -hmm. effects of publishing this story right now? Does it need to be more balanced? So those are the trade-offs we make all the time. And that's, I think, one of the strong suits of mainstream media and why it's so important to keep it financially viable. Mm -hmm. But it, I, there's, but I think some of the criticisms of, of journalism in the last uh, year or so have, have been around the idea that um, the pursuit of alternative viewpoints um, blends very quickly into the, you know, pursuit of quack viewpoints, right? Um, you know, if we're seeking viewpoint diversity, and I think you make the point very clearly that, you know, viewpoint diversity is the, the, the necessary ingredient to the pursuit of the truth, right? But, but how do you, I mean, if there has to be some limits, right, on the pursuit of viewpoint diversity, we're, we're not going to allow astrologers to, you know, get equal say in, in, the universities, um, you know, I think politicians have exploited this idea of viewpoint diversity so that you always seek out somebody who's saying something that is, you know, completely different, even if it doesn't make any sense. How do you, how do you know, right? How, where do you go and pursue the alternative views? I say to my students, if all your friends agree with you, then you're, then you've got a problem, right? Go seek new friends, but, but you certainly don't want to seek friends that, you know, are, crazy right so how do you know which well if you're a journalist if we're pursue? talking about journalism which which we have been for the last 10 or so minutes i assume we're talking specifically about journalism and not some of these other fields mm -hmm. um, if you're a journalist your job is to go out and get multiple viewpoints and then collate them and then try to figure out what's right and then tell the story in a way that's both fair and coherent mm -hmm. it's really hard to do by the way you know people imagine anyone sitting on their sofa with a laptop can do this. It, it takes years of acculturation to understand this. But viewpoint diversity is the input, not the output. It's the job of a journalist or an editor, or for that matter, the job of a scientist or a researcher, um, or perhaps more aptly, a, a journal, to look at all that stuff and then filter it and then try to figure out what is well-supported and what is less well-supported. So in order to do the job, you need the whole variety of inputs but the output is involves a lot of professional judgment about what you think is well established if you're doing it right you try to share that with your readership you, you try to show your work um, if you're rejecting a point of view that's prominent you try to explain why you've rejected it, what that's based on you don't always have time to do that you don't always get it right but but those are the norms that we at least try to adhere to i thought one of the interesting metaphors that you used was this idea of the funnel, right? Where, you know, you start with a, a pluralism of, of viewpoints, uh, but ultimately you need to kind of winnow it down into something that we can agree upon. Um, and uh, a corollary to that was that you said that, you know, in the old days when you wanted to kind of censor things, or you wanted to control the discourse, what you would do was um, kind of control what, what, what went in, right? So you would um, control what, what, what went in, right? So you would um, limit the number of viewpoints that people had access to, uh, flood the channels with with a, an even larger number of of viewpoints in, in order to kind of jam the system. Um, this this is. Could you talk a bit about that? I found that that fascinating. I talked to Damon Santola, who is a uh, uh, network theorist at the University of Pennsylvania, and he talked about how the Chinese government used. Uh, use this. They gave up on, on at least a couple years back, they gave up on censorship and so decided to um, just jam the channels with all sorts of, of content uh, in order to obfuscate the, you know, the, the, the messages that were more accurate. Yeah. In the, um, in the old days, the old media ecology that, that I grew up in, the scarce resource was access. 
very hard to put your views out unless you had access to a printing press or a TV station or something of that sort. Of course, digital media completely changes that world, so access is ubiquitous. Now what's scarce is attention. So the target now, if you want to try to manipulate the information environment, is attention more than access. So instead of censoring stuff by trying to ban it so that people can't see it or, or read it, you do what Stephen Bannon, who was an advisor to Donald Trump, called flooding the zone with shit. This is a hallowed type of disinformation tactic called by RAND researchers the fire hose of falsehood, mm -hmm. something that Russians have used very adeptly, one of a number of tactics that are now used to manipulate the information environment, confuse us, disorient us, deceive us, ultimately divide and demoralize us as a country. And here the notion is if you just put enough different falsehoods, exaggerations, conspiracy theories out through enough channels at a fast enough rate, it doesn't matter if they're implausible or inconsistent. In the time it takes mainstream media to knock one down, you've already put out five or 10 others. This is what Trump is doing when he, he's clocked at approximately 20 lies a day on average by the Washington Post fact checker in the 2016 campaign, 70%, seven zero, not one seven percent of what he said that was checked by PolitiFact was false. The control there would be Hillary Clinton, for whom this equivalent number is 25%. Still too high, but most of what she said was true. Most of what Trump said was false. His first acts as president are to lie about whether it's raining during his, his inauguration and the crowd size. Obvious, easily checkable things. This is not about persuasion. This is about flooding the zone with shit so people become so confused that they don't know who to believe anymore. The mainstream media gets outraged and can't keep up with it, throws up their hands, and ordinary people just become confused. And they, they, they don't, who do I trust in this environment? And they don't know. So the situation we're dealing with, unfortunately, is for the first time, certainly in modern American history, uh, closest precedent might be the 1850s. We have seen the adaptation and application of Russian-style mass disinformation tactics to U.S. politics by American actors, namely Donald Trump and his MAGA allies in conservative media and Republican politics and the Republican base. This is new. It's very hard to cope with. These are very sophisticated tactics. So, um, I mean, it seems like this the, is a the, problem. the shift it's is a real problem. really one dictated by the industrial organization of information production, right? So one argument could be that the reason why we saw uh, a move towards journalistic integrity is sort of driven by the same economic forces that allowed Stalin and Hitler to monopolize the kind of news media in their countries, which was that, um, you know, there are these economies of scale, right? There's only so many television channels that you can have. There's only so many radio channels that you can have. Um, and, and now we've, we've seen just this opening up of access, right? So that anybody can grab their own communication channel. Um, and, and so it, it's really the kind of industrial organization uh, of information transmission that, that's driving all this. Do you think it's, it's more about the technology or do you, do you see that there's a kind of a cultural trend. Is, is the cultural trend just sort of the superstructure that's, that's, that's driven by this technological change or is there, is there something else going on? And, and if we were to, is it, is it, if, yeah. Can I answer that? <laughs> Can I answer that question? Yes. The whole thing. Um, it's, it's all of the above. This is hard because to th understand what's happening here, we have to be able to walk and chew gum, um, and maybe also talk and sing at the same time. So there's no question that the technology here is important. Part of it's what you mentioned, that it's now so easy to go online and invent a conspiracy theory. Um, partly it's the development of sophisticated bots and algorithms, which can immediately see which conspiracy theories, for example, are going viral and ampli amplify them at the speed of light far faster than human fact checkers could, could ever keep up with them. 
Um, so these ideas, these memes go viral um, and spread and mutate much faster than they could in the old media environment where everything, you know, was laboriously checked in theory before it went in. So technology is a big piece of it. My reading of the evidence, so Greg, is that technology is number three on the list of the reasons that we're seeing so much misinformation and disinformation and that it's been weaponized so effectively in politics. Number two appears to be cable news, Fox News, OAN, um, Newsmax, also to some extent MSNBC on the left. But this is primarily on the right at the moment. Talk radio is part of this. That is not new technology. That is a development, something you alluded to earlier, of a media market which whose business model is not getting it right, but amplifying whatever it is, is confirming people's biases, what it is that they want to hear. The number one thing, though, and it looks like well ahead of numbers two and three, is as old as the hills, mm -hmm. and that is the amplifying power of politicians. There is nothing new about that. Um, but the bully pulpit that you get from being president of the United States, being able to set the agenda, being able to command the resources of a political party, this is absolutely immense. And although Twitter made it considerably easier for President Trump when he was president to do what he wanted to do, he also could have done that with all of the conventional tools of the presidency, maybe not quite as quickly or effectively, but he would have had no trouble putting out through conservative media, through the White House, um, through press conferences, through rallies, through all the mechanisms he enjoyed, he'd have no problem putting out the idea that the election was stolen. And indeed, long before Trump, politicians have had no trouble putting out uh, organized falsehoods. Hitler, Lenin, Mussolini, all of them were very good at it. So what we need to do here is, yes, social media, digital media is super important, Got to deal with it, but we must not become obsessed with it. They are right, an so accelerant. So when the printing press came along, it, it kind of created a whole lot of disruption, right? Because there was all this new forms of communication, which allowed for you know the emergence of all these factions, which kind of went to war with one another. And maybe this technological explosion is creating a similar shock that will ultimately can we ultimately will reach some new equilibrium. But but I think. Um, you know, when I saw President Trump first started paying attention to his campaign and, and ultimately his communications after election, you know, I, I thought this was I, I didn't I, th I thought this is just the flip side. This is just a natural consequence of trends that I had seen, say, in academia. Right. The rise of kind of more relativistic viewpoints. Um, and it seemed to me that this was kind of percolating within academia for, for decades, long before the emergence of, of social media and even the emergence of, of cable television. To what extent is the um, what we're seeing in politics uh, a reflection of, of what we've been seeing in, in academia? Uh, and, you know, some people think academics are, are not relevant, but I think that others would argue that what happens in academia ultimately proliferates to the rest of society, you know, not too long after. Before I weigh in, since you're in a better position to judge that than I am, what do you think is the answer to that question? How much do you think Trump and his his kind of post-truth tactics owe to the postmodern movement? I don't movement think that one causes academia? the other, but I do think that they're both kind of uh, ref reflections, perhaps, of some other underlying um, trend, uh, which which of which I, I I I'm not sure, you know. As an historian, I'm always reluctant to, to, uh, to claim that things are any different than they've ever been, but, um, but I do think that there's there's some some parallels between these two, these two movements, even though on the surface they appear to be uh, on politically opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, that seems about right to me. I don't have a a firm answer settled in my mind about the extent to which the disinformation and post-truth tactics that we've seen come out of Trump and the MAGA right have roots in academic postmodernism. But people have written whole books arguing that there are these deep connections and that, in fact, 
people mm -hmm. in Trump world were acquainted with postmodernism. I think Bannon has has talked about that. So there there does seem to be an influence, but what you said seems more right. I, I really have no evidence to judge, but you know, it's evolutionary theorists say humans did not descend from chimps. The important thing is that chimps mm -hmm. and humans descended from a common ancestor. And there does seem to be a kind of common ancestor here in the challenging the idea that truth is, is a thing, really. Once you challenge it from the left, it becomes easier to challenge it from the right. The growing mistrust of institutions in the US, which make it harder to trust, for example, science and make people in some cases, rightly more skeptical. I'm a homosexual American and science wronged us terribly for decades by insisting that we were mentally ill. That got fixed in the 70s, but not till I was 13 years old. So the decline of confidence in inf institutions um, and mistakes along the way probably all contributed to creating an environment where it was just easier for people to, to say, well, you know, it's all a rigged game. Don't believe any of those people. Yeah. But well, you have written extensively about kind of what is happening in uh, the academy, what, what's happening in American uh, universities. Um, and in particular, you talk about uh, kind of cancel culture. Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I certainly spend a lot of time thinking about this because um, in, in some ways it's, it's easier to um, dismiss what might be disagreeable or erroneous thinking by by people who are different from yourself but when you see people who are you know much more similar to yourselves engaging in these practices it's a little bit more more worrisome um and so you know to what extent do you, do you what do you think is really driving the the what what's called can first of all let's let's define this because i think a lot of people don't you know cancel culture is kind of a um stands for something much larger, right? What, what, is, what is this term cancel culture? And is, are we obsessing, are we spending too much time focusing on the, the deep platforming of, um, you, you know, provocative folks like uh, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos? <laughs> um, is, is, that, is that really a concern or uh, is, is that just sort of the, the wedge that leads to the dismissal of, of respectable academics? Well, I'm, again, I'm tempted if you let me to to flip that around and ask you because you're sitting there at uh, at UCB and Stanford, so you, you're in the thick of this. Um, <laughs> I'm tempted to make you go well, first if if you would let me. Uh, well, can I make I, I you think, go first, or do you want me to take a There's quite a bit of what it? you refer to as as self censorship, and I, I think that really that's that's probably in many ways uh, the, the the bigger threat, right? So there doesn't need to be a lot of explicit um, you know, removal of individuals from their positions. Uh, and you see, you know, there's certainly some of that, but I think that the bigger, the bigger concern is, as you point out in the book, right. And as John Stuart Mill points out in, in his book, the, the idea that people will simply refuse to engage in conversations because they're concerned about different tripwires that might lead them to become ostracized or, or, um, you know, avoided by, by their colleagues. Can I ask, feel free to duck this if it's getting too personal, but can I ask if you're someone who feels that self-censorship is part you know, of I think your it's, routine? It's, to some degree, I don't think it's as severe in, uh, say, you know, business schools. Um, and, but I do, I do think that it, it's certainly present. It's certainly an underlying uh, background concern. And I think it's also a function of the, the security that one has in, in employment. So if you're a tenured faculty member, it's really less of a concern. If you're untenured, I think it's a much bigger concern. And certainly if you're a student, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very big concern. I've, I've heard from many students the, the idea that they don't feel comfortable uh, raising difficult uh, points and, and, and it's even, I, I find the, the, the bigger issue is that even when you're talking about things that have virtually nothing to do with um, hot button issues, that, that students don't have the tools that they need in order to resolve disagreements. So even if you're looking at a business case where it's like, hey, you know, should you, you know, expand your market or not expand your market, um, the, the, the students, when they, if they start with an initial disagreement, 
that's built on some intuition, uh, they, they don't feel comfortable articulating it or elaborating on it because they're concerned that it might infringe on someone else's initial position. And so they're, they're more inclined to kind of agree to disagree now. And so, so even, mm. even when you're not even talking, what's that? I think it is. I is think that it a is new a, development. Yeah. I think it is a new, I think it is a, it's, it's certainly oh, go a trend. Ahead. I'm sorry. Um, and I don't know whether it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's maybe a byproduct of this idea that, that your, you know, your, your beliefs and opinions are constitute your identity and, and therefore, um, a challenge to your idea would be a challenge to you or a challenge to your identity. So the ability to kind of examine a position independent of, of the holder of the position, that's something which is under, under, um, under threat, I think. Well, that's extremely interesting, and it's consistent with with what I hear from lots of people in, in academia, and it's also consistent with the polls, which find that sixty to seventy percent of students are watching what they say, There's, and and are telling pollsters that they're reluctant to state their true political views because they're afraid of offending someone or being accused of something. Um, and this number is almost as high in the American public. Um, in fact. Not only do 60% say that they're reluctant to state their political views for fear of social consequences, but a third say that they're worried about losing their job or professional or career opportunities if they're honest about their politics. And that third, by the way, is not predominantly on the right. It's the same all the way across the spectrum. It includes progressives. Um, it's all the way across. And if you're engaging in canceling, that's what you want. You want self-policing. You want over-policing. You want an environment where people don't know what it's safe to say, so they just shut up, so they police themselves, and then you don't have to do it. So what are we talking about here? Let me just go up to a sort of 10,000-foot level. What we've been talking about are ways to manipulate there, there are tactics called information warfare, or I call them epistemic warfare. And these are ways to manipulate the social and media environment for political advantage by fooling people's brains, tricking us into believing wrong things, or confusing us, distracting us, deceiving us. One way to do that, which we already talked about, is the use of disinformation techniques like the ones that the Russians are so good at, or that Donald Trump is brilliant at. There's a second method, though, which is social coercion. If you can convince people that no one agrees with them and that what they think is shameful, they will silence themselves. And in fact, they will be even in many cases become ashamed of their point of view. So suppose you have an environment like a college campus and suppose what's really a surprisingly small number of activists, probably on the hard left these days on the college campus, can weaponize things like course evaluations, uh, social ostracism, university investigations, um, condemnations, so social sanctions. You know, no one sits with you at lunch or people snap their fingers at you in class. Suppose they can mobilize all of those tactics to intimidate people so that students and professors think, you know what, it's just easier to stay away from those subjects. I don't want to get in trouble. Well, what they can do is falsify the consensus so that it looks like what this really small number of people believe is the predominant view. And because we're consensus-seeking animals, because we tune not just our beliefs, our opinions, but even our perceptions to harmonize with what we think the people around us believe, mm -hmm. you can actually spoof people into thinking, well, no one agrees with me. Uh, I, I give up. I'm not going to push back. I'm not going to speak. I'm just going to graduate in three or four years. I'm just going to keep my head low. I'm going to self-police, and I'm probably wrong or shameful if I disagree with the consensus. Now, this is a very old tactic. John Stuart Mill referred to it in, in 1859 as the biggest threat to liberty in England. Alexis de Tocqueville referred to it in 1835 as the biggest threat mm -hmm. to freedom in America. It's the use of social coercion to manipulate the information environment to cause intimidation, demoralization, make us feel helpless. Well, um, social media, of course, makes that much easier, right? It used to be pretty hard to gin up a petition campaign to fire Greg LeBlanc if he says something you don't like, or just to make an example of him. Now it's trivially easy. Put it out on social media, and if you play your cards right, within a day, you've got people all over the country 
calling up UCB and demanding that he be fired or at least investigated. So you got a technological aspect. You also have the fact that, that people who are engaging in these coercive tactics have discovered kind of the soft underbelly of free speech culture, which is employers. Employers are not in the business of hosting conversations, dialogues, controversial speakers. So if I make Gregory LeBlanc controversial, well, there's lots of other employees who can do the same job who aren't controversial. So say goodbye to Gregory, Le Gregory LeBlanc. And then the third thing is you've got all these establishments on campus that will uh, support and initiate things like investigations of professors on even very slight, sometimes frivolous allegations. I just talking to a professor a few weeks ago at uh, public university who was called in for a two and a half hour grilling by a mid-level human resources or student life bureaucrat because one student, one student complained about his course saying he was too conservative and doing things like, according to the student, mm -hmm. um, using the words black and African-American mm -hmm. as nouns when they should only be used as adjectives. Now in a sane world, these are not allegations of academic misconduct and the answer to that student should be go talk to your professor. In the world we now live in, the student files a complaint with the administration and there follows a full dress investigation and I ask the professor who's telling me about it, did you take a lawyer to your interrogation? And he said, no, it hasn't come to that yet. And this could take weeks or months to resolve and it's a bruising process, so why go through it? So you have this conjunction of things that allows these minorities to manipulate opinion and chill speech and thought. Um, that's what I refer to as counseling. The, the term came along when I was still working on the book. I was using the term social coercion or mm -hmm. coerced conformity, but counseling will do just fine. Right. And I think administrators, you know, th there may be administrators who subscribe to this, but I think for the job of administrators is, is in many ways just to kind of... You know, they just, they just want to reduce their workload. <laughs> they just want to, like, avoid hassles. And so if, if they start, if some professor is, you know, they have to field a whole bunch of um, complaints about a professor, then, you know, they just want those complaints even to go one away. one complaint. And they like, just want to get that. To, what know, happens? They don't want to deal with it. They want to have, yeah, what? they want to eliminate the source of, of friction. So how confident do you feel that, suppose you're teaching and, a student or two students or maybe three students complain about a case study you're using, saying it's insensitive mm -hmm. and triggering, and they file a complaint with the administration. How confident are you that this would this would be an experience that you where you would get support from the administration if you had taught in a reasonable, customary fashion? Well, I, I think that increasingly we have this view that the students are, con are customers, right? And so, you know, it's their voice that is the most important voice. And so I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel a whole lot of confidence that the administration would necessarily back me up. But I also know that there's a lot of frictions and a lot of um, inefficiency. And so, and so most of these things will, will, you know, blow over, at least in, in business schools, because people have to get on with doing their thing and apply for jobs. And after they've engaged in some virtue signaling, they, they tend to tend to move on. But, but I think that might be just a short term phenomenon and it does depend on the school. But, but the thing that's worrisome to me, and you, you talked a bit about how we need kind of viewpoint diversity um, and mentioned the small number of say conservatives in, or Republicans in the university. I'm sort of less troubled by that because I, I feel like if, if everyone is, if we're pursuing, especially in the sciences, right? So, you know, your normative commitments are one thing, but when that starts to creep into um, an intolerance for viewpoints around scientific claims, which, which are not normative, which have nothing to do with normative, purely on the basis that people think, well, if that's true, that's going to strengthen folks who have a particular normative commitment. So in other words, we're gonna, we're gonna intercept that positive claim and, and make it impossible for people to debate that positive claim purely because of what we think might, you know, what it might support or not support on, on the, in the normative realm, right? This might give ammunition to, to the people who have these, you know, normative positions that we, we, we disagree with. So, you know, if we're looking into, 
uh, you know, genetics or we're looking into, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, education or we're looking into different, you know, causal mechanisms for, for different types of, of behaviors or whatever. Those kinds of debates are, are just not, um, you're not able to have them. I mean, I had a colleague who uh, was trying to just simply describe uh, uh, segmentation by gender uh, that various firms use. I mean, pretty much every firm uses this. And, um, you know, that, that professor was essentially not allowed to teach anymore because uh, he was talking about segmentation by gender. Now, I think if the reason why is, I think, because he didn't preface what he was describing with his disapproval, his normative disapproval. He said, oh, here's what they do. And by the way, I don't, I think it's terrible. I think it would have been fine uh, if he said, here's what they do. And I think it's great. Then he would have been ostracized. But just by saying, here's what they do and not saying, you know, whether he liked it or didn't like it or he thought it was good or bad, then everybody had to guess, like, is this person supporting this? Is this person not supporting it? And, every, and since everyone, because everything has to have a normative, uh, everything has to be described through a normative lens at this point. That's, I think, the biggest threat. When you, to when you say he wasn't allowed to teach, did he lose his job? What happened to him? Well, he, he, the students refused to attend the class anymore. And so, yeah, he, was, he, was, he stopped teaching it. And he was not allowed to flunk the students? No. Which is normally what you do if students refuse to attend class. Well, I mean, I, had, I, I gave a question on uh, my final exam where um, uh, it was basically a question about uh, labor participation in the job market and differential uh, impact of things on, on male versus female participation in, in the job market, um, which is a, you know, a huge issue in, um, during coronavirus crisis. There was a much larger number of women who withdrew from the workforce uh, due to um, you know domestic demands and so forth, and so you know this was a question on on the exam. Just say, hey, you know, um, how do you how, how do you explain this? Can you use economics to explain this? And this this created a massive uproar. I mean, a third of the class signed a petition saying that this was this this had no place in the in a top business school because it implied that women ought to be housewives, right? And it's like there was no such <laughs> implication, right? It was just. No, like there's if, no if, such implication. If, 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 if I had prefaced, say, if I'd used a, a normative word like, you know, forced out of the workforce or, or um, you know, something like that, instead of just, you know, leaving the workforce, then it would have, if my normative commitments were made more explicit, then this, the whole thing wouldn't have happened. But if you try to use a completely non-normative language, just a purely descriptive language, just a pure scientific description, it, 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 you know, it, it throws your, your normative commitments into question and then opens up the door for, for, uh, you know, for, for sanction. What what was the result in that particular case? Uh, well, uh, it just, it, it blew over. (laughs) Just, you know, they took the exam and you graded the exam and there were no consequences beyond the fact that you will never again make the mistake of risking that particular kind of uprising. Well, I think any, any, any questions, any questions related to, to gender is just not going to be part of the course anymore. Um, we're just, we're just not going to, we're not going to study that. We're just not going to discuss that. Well, okay. Do you feel like you're serving your students as well as you could be if you're leaving that aspect of marketing out? Not at all. I think it's actually a disservice to, to the students. I think it's a, it's because it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty, pretty important pretty important thing. Um, if you want to understand what's happening out there right now, you understand the suffering that people are going through. And if you want to understand the, the difficulties that companies are having right now in, in recruiting uh, workforce, I mean, you, you have to you have to discuss it. You know, we see examples of this again and again. If, if you want to understand what's going on with um, racial justice in crime and policing, you, you need to understand that at multiple levels and you need to be able to take on issues like not just what are the, uh, what are the rates of police violence, but what are the levels at which police encounter people in diff- different demographics to the extent we can determine what are the underlying crime rates. What are the causes of that? You've got to be able to discuss all this stuff if you want to get the right answer in order to solve the problem. And to my mind, you, you can't have the justice if you can't solve the problem. Policing the words does not solve the problem. 
I can say that as a as a gay American who for spent more than the last 30 years writing as openly gay, campaigning for same-sex marriage, dealing with the bigots and the bad ideas, as well as the well-intentioned people who just thought they were protecting a vital American institution. Um, and that's who that's most of them actually, not not the haters, but well-intentioned people who who just didn't have it right. Um, but the goal at the end of the day had to be to encounter these ideas in order to be able to replace them with better ones and then ultimately to solve the problem. And it, it breaks my heart to hear teachers, and I've heard many of them say what you just said, which is they're, they're now important aspects of, of their literature, of, of scientific knowledge, and of academic discourse where they won't go because of fear of normative disapproval. Um, I, I, typical example. You said this this occurs occurs in non scientific fields. I think you said something like that earlier. Well, I talked to a a um, neurobiologist who studies and teaches brain development, and early in her course, she had a module on um, autism, which is you know a developmental mm -hmm. thing that happens early in life, and a student, just one student who was well known as a complainer and an activist, complained to the administration that this could be triggering or, um, or in some way demoting, demeaning to people with autism. Now, no one with autism had complained. Um, her department chair said all the right things, and Dean, they both said, you don't need mm -hmm. to remove this from your course. You should not remove this from your course. This is don't pay attention to this student. And I said, well, that's a great outcome. So you, you left it in the course. And she said, no, I took autism out of the course. I said, what? Why? And she said, because I understood this complaint to be strike one. And she was junior faculty at that point. She didn't want a strike two and a strike three. So I said, what did you do? She said, well, I put epilepsy in instead. And that's not as good. It's just not as appropriate. It doesn't teach it as well. It's not really on point in the same way. Um, but that's what she did. And then I said to her, well, well, you know, this won't make you safer. They'll just, if someone's going to come after you, they'll find something else. This is not about the particulars of what you're teaching. This is about power. This is about exerting control over you and other students and the curriculum on campus. And this is a small minority doing this, and you're allowing this to happen. And she said, yeah, I know all that but what am I supposed to do? So it makes you wonder, you know, in order to solve a problem, you really have to understand it, right? And if, 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 you're, if, you, if, you, if you kind of eliminate your pursuit of knowledge, then it means, I think, it reveal, the revealed preferences that you're really more interested in, in grandstanding and, and, you know, signaling your virtue and achieving status within your, your community, but you're not really interested in, in solving the problem, one would think. I mean, that's, that's how I... That's how I understand this behavior. If I'm trying to, you know, just use my, put on my economist hat and reverse engineer what, what people are doing based on the impact, it, it means that they're, they're just not interested in solving the problem, right? Because they're, they're truncating their inquiry into the, the, the facts and, and, the, and the science around that they need to understand if they wish to make a change. Yeah, or or they have this 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 kind of strange view that a lot of people now seem to have that that if you manipulate the words, then you're changing somehow addressing the problem. You know, like the student who wants the professor never to use African American as a noun. Now it's it's hard for me to understand how that, for example, ends the war on drugs. But somehow in that student's mind, there is a connection at some deep level, I guess, between policing speech and improving the world. Um, but you know, something, maybe you can tell me this, Greg, because it, it puzzles me. I think that the majority of students and the majority of academics, in fact, the large majority are not on board with these kinds of tactics of, of domination and information manipulation, epistemic manipulation. Increasingly, progressives on campus have come to the realization that hiding from being policed or trying to stay politically correct won't protect them because this is not fundamentally about 
putting a few specific ideas off limit. This is about creating a maximum chill. Mm -hmm. It's like what you know Stalin does, what all dictators do. You never know what they're going to come after you for, and you don't want people to know that because you want them to feel endangered all the time so that they will maximally suppress themselves. Progressives are figuring out that they are targets. In fact, more targeted than conservatives who at least have the Federalist Society to fall back on. So what I'm waiting to happen, and maybe it is happening, is for students and especially faculty and especially tenured faculty who have job security, who have just started to feel tired of being pushed around, when do we start getting real pushback from them? Well, I think that most faculty members just want to do their work. And, and as long as they're, they're left alone, they're, they're not going to, you know, say or do anything. And, and, um, and so I, I think for most people, they just think it's not going to happen to them. Uh, it's, it's going to, it's, it's somebody else's problem. And, uh, and, and they think that, you know, it'll, it'll blow over. Um, and then others, you know, others are, are, are think that they can many, many ways take advantage of it. Right. I mean, I don't, I, I think it's just an extension of organizational politics in many ways. I mean, people have been using, um, you know, lies and rumors and all sorts of things to get ahead in, in organizations. Um, a lot of what you talk about in terms of, you know, creating false ideas and trolling. I mean, that, that's been a tool in the toolbox of ambitious people and organizations for as long as we've had ambitious people. Um, and so I think a lot of people think, well, okay, this is, this is yet another tool that I have in order to kind of get ahead in my, my field. I can, I can leverage this somehow. Well, I guess we'll see. I'm, I'm kind of surprised at the willingness of American academics to let themselves be used as doormats, let themselves be outnumbered by bureaucrats, um, let themselves be bossed around by mid-level HR people who call them in for two and a half hour meetings to justify what they're doing in their classroom. This a bureaucrat, presumably, who has never set foot in a classroom as a teacher, the right answer in that situation is you don't have jurisdiction, go away. This is between me and my students. So I'm, I'm just continually surprised by the extent to which um, faculties have allowed their powers to ebb on campus. On the other hand, we've seen the birth of the Academic Freedom Alliance out of Princeton, which is a kind of NATO to defend academic freedom against the left and the right. And we're seeing the formation of alumni groups who want to start um, lobbying mm -hmm. administrations for free speech. Um, we saw President Zimmer at Chicago gave us all an object lesson when he responded to a cancel campaign against an astrophysicist who wrote something politically controversial. The usual several hundred grad students and whenever wrote the usual petition demanding he investi be investigated for making campus life unsafe. And President Zimmer put out a one paragraph statement saying, we at Chicago believe in free speech. The professor was, in, was um, exercising that right. There's nothing here to investigate. The result of that was that the counselors went off in search of another target. And just today, the announcement of University of Austin, which mm -hmm. is an entire new university being built from scratch around the principles of open inquiry and free speech and anti-fragility. So maybe things are starting to stir a little, but I don't know. Well, I was wondering if you could comment on, on kind of at the corporate level, right? Because look, a university, if it um, squelches scientific inquiry, it, you know, it'll, you know, it'll slip in the rankings potentially. Maybe it'll find it more difficult to attract good faculty. Maybe the students sooner or later, high quality students will stop going there. But you know, that's going to take a long time. And um, you know, certainly in journalism, right? If 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 you know, there's a race to the bottom, it'll probably wind up with more profits anyway. But in, in the corporate world, if if companies have conversations squelched, if if they can't openly discuss ideas that those companies will very quickly uh kind of go out of business and and uh and google found that in order to promote ideas they have to have 
what they call psychological safety. And psychological safety to them means being able to, to speak up, being able to express your ideas. And yet I think this idea of psychological safety has been kind of turned on its head. And, and, and now most people, when they think of that term, they think of it as meaning being protected from hearing what other people might say. And, and in the same way that, you know, this concept of diversity uh, or, you know, perspective diversity has kind of, and there's lots of research on the benefits of perspective diversity has kind of been captured and transformed into a kind of a very, very different type of, of diversity that doesn't really capture the original meaning. Do you, how important is psychological safety within within organizations, and and it, and how much faith do you have that that organizations, profit making organizations, uh, understand the importance of this, and and you know to what extent are they actually going down this road of of discouraging open conversation? We've seen some examples of, of companies and institutions kind of responding to um, employees who have insisted on the kind of squelching of different opinions within the companies. Well, ironically, of course, the most prominent example of that behavior was at Google, mm -hmm. which fired a programmer named James Damore after he circulated a memo. Um, as far as I can tell, it was a thoughtful memo and factually accurate in much of what it said, even if some people viewed it as controversial or distasteful. And um, after some employees got their underwear tied in a knot about it, uh, he was he was fired. So it looks like, in fact, employers are, if anything, as I mentioned earlier, the soft underbelly of free speech culture. So psychological safety is not the term I would use for what you're describing um, that is an open intellectual environment because it's it's been weaponized, it's been altered to mean safety from ideas that might make someone feel offended, uncomfortable, um, aggressed, traumatized, pick your word. That is a doctrine to which I give no quarter in the book because learning only happens when we are forced to encounter ideas that we find offensive, wrongheaded, bigoted, sometimes hateful, difficult. Now, we need to encounter them in physically safe settings, and we need to encounter them in settings where they are stated in non-threatening ways. Um, and science, uh, the reality-based community, works very hard to make that happen. That's why I can't open an academic article with the words, mm -hmm. Gregory, you ignorant slut, or Gregory, you should be killed for saying, for, for having written the article you just wrote. So the environment needs to be physically safe, and it needs to be safe from, from harassment and the like. But emotional safety is not something we're looking for. We're actually looking for a place where people can take some emotional risks. Traditionally, that was something that universities strive to do, um, confront students with difficult ideas. I still remember when I was a, a freshman in college in my political theory course, a, a woman broke down and cried at one point mm -hmm. because the professor was playing the skeptical card he was asking, what are you certain of? And, and someone said, well, we're all certain we'll die. And he said, well, how do you know? And then this young woman said, well, everyone's always died. And he said, but how do you know you'll die? Mm -hmm. And she started to cry. It was an embarrassing moment, but it was a learning moment for all of us. When you hit these ideas, it's, it's really tough, right? So what's important to create an environment where people can feel safe to advocate minority views, dissident views, views that the majority will find offensive. Like, for example, homosexuality is equal in moral value to heterosexuality, a terribly controversial statement that was universally reviled, except by a handful of people in America when I grew up. In order to create that environment, you need institutional norms and safeguards. On the first day, you need students, for example, to walk in the door and be told, preferably in freshman orientation, as happens at Purdue University, at this university, the principles of the First Amendment apply. Here's what they are. Students don't know that hate speech is constitutionally protected. No one's told them that. No wonder that they want to sanction hate speech. Um, 
you need to have, you need to say to students, uh, yeah, at this campus, sure, you're a customer, we value your business, but we're in the business of education and that's going to mean confronting some ideas that are going to be sometimes difficult to hear. Um, that's what we do here. So you need these kinds of institutional norms and inculcation. And the question is, is that still doable? By the way, one of the, the most moving passages that I've read in quite a while was from your book where you described how you were being interviewed and, and some caller said that you were the most dangerous man in America. Oh yeah. <laughs> because you made gay marriage sound so reasonable. And and when I read that I was just I was I, I was I was profoundly moved by that by that moment because of you know it it it's just, it says so much um but why is it then that i mean people sign up for tough mutter right people put themselves they go to these um you know prayer tents in new mexico that are like 150 degrees like people will do the boston marathon people there is a demand for difficult things and so why don't we see kind of some universities kind of differentiating themselves from the marketplace by promising that they will be difficult places, by promising that they will test your, your assumptions and test your beliefs and, and challenge your biases. Like, why is that not a different, I mean, you'd think that out of the thousand universities, at least half of them would, would be, you know, promoting themselves as with this as, as their brand. And yet you don't see that, you don't, barely see a single university. I know University of Chicago certainly has the principles, but it's not like in their logo, come here to be, you know, to, to have all your beliefs questioned, right? Come here to be challenged. That's not yeah, something they actually, which... They actually, at one point a few years ago, they, they tried sending a letter out to uh, the incoming freshman class, basically saying what you just said, which is don't expect coddling if you come here. And there was so much pushback from students and parents that they stopped doing that and they started looking for other ways to do it. Um, well, I don't know the answer to that question, Greg. Um, I do know that a lot of students say to pollsters and others and to me that they would like to be challenged with more viewpoint diversity than they get. Um, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill did a really wonderful in-depth study of the intellectual environment on campus. The three political scientists did it, and they really did it right. And one of the things they found is that liberal students wanted to be exposed to more conservative viewpoints, more of these tough debates. They wanted to see more debate, confrontation of ideas. They wanted less protection. And I think that's actually probably true on more campuses. Uh, and, and I'm not sure why we're not seeing more of that, but I will say that I'm on the board of advisors of University of Austin. And one of the things that that project is going to test is, okay, we're gonna put, put a tent out and say, this is, we're a different kind of university uh, we're going to challenge you, and, and if you come here, that's what you should expect, and we'll see. The notion there is, you know, you obviously can't revolutionize American universities overnight, but if you can plant a flag and people will rally to it, um, then maybe you can have some demonstration effect to the rest. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned that um, the founders said that if we lose Republican virtue, then the, then no wall of parchment will ever protect us, right? And that the Constitution cannot support itself. So on the one hand, the Constitution is, is designed to deal with us imperfect humans, but at some level, if, if, we, um, if the virtue drops below some threshold level, the whole thing collapses. So do, does the Constitution acknowledge, I mean, are, are, we, are we at that level where the, the, the virtue is, is, is dipping below sustainable levels, how can we make sure that the, the virtue that is needed to keep the system alive is, is maintained? Does, does, it, does it start at a, at a young age? You mentioned at one point that, um, you know, parents are preparing the world for their kids rather than preparing their kids for the world. Is, is there, is there a, a, a sense in which we're, we're not educating people for their role in this, this social network of, of knowledge creation? It's, it's an all of the above thing. I think my part in this process is to try to surface the idea that there is a constitution of knowledge and it's like the U.S. Constitution. If we don't understand its obligations and burdens, 
uh, and don't support it, it will not survive. Madison and uh, Adams and Lincoln, all of them warned us about that. They said it won't be a foreign enemy that does us in. It will be the loss of our own constitutional values. And the same is true right now. So my little bit is to try to tell people there is a constitutional knowledge, marketplace of ideas, free speech is not enough. You've got to defend these rigorous processes that are sometimes painful to people. Um, and here's why. So, and then I think it's it's got to be a process of civic renewal at a lot of levels. In universities, it's going to require stronger leadership from university presidents who can set the tone all the way down um, and begin changing the tone, reducing some of the powers of administrative oversight, which are causing such a chilling effect. I think it puts an obligation on faculty, especially tenured faculty, to not do what you described earlier, which is decide to go on with their research and make it someone else's problem, because ultimately it will redound against them and the universities, the institutions that they rely on, will suffer. It's going to require alumni to do what they're now doing. Five campuses, and I think the movement's going to spread, to begin pressuring uh, their alma maters to stop giving in mm -hmm. to people who are manipulating the campus environment, canceling, um, silencing, deplatforming. I think it's going to mean students. Yeah, they need to be better, better educated in high school. That's for sure. Loss of civic education, civics education, I guess, was has been a calamity. So that's got to be done. And then we got to figure out ways to empower the silent majority of students on most campuses who would like more intellectual diversity and rigorous contention and not less. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just in the academic world. That's before we get to the world of politics and um, disinformation in the, in the world of, of politics. So it's an all of the above strategy. And a lot of it is for people like you and me, instead of just sitting here to figure out what, what can we do today in our institutions to push the values of the constitution of knowledge forward, to make ourselves and the people around us cognizant of them and then to defend them. Because I believe that in most of our environments, people like you and me can find ways to do that. And it might be speaking up in that faculty meeting against a deplatforming that someone wants to do. It might be saying, uh, you know, this conservative hire, uh, we need to give this person attention. We don't, we need political diversity. Let's not discriminate. All kinds of ways in our daily lives that we can support these values. But if we don't, no one will do it for us. Yeah, and I think my them. students, for the most part, I just think they, they feel like they haven't been armed properly with an understanding of the tools of persuasion. Uh, and the the logic of argumentation, and the um, ability to, you know, separate out their understanding of of people from from their positions. And I think, you know, they eagerly do soak up uh, this insight. You know, when you provide it to them. And you know, we launched a an orientation class on on critical thinking for all of our incoming MBAs, which which talks a bit about you know, the fundamentals of persuasion and, and argumentation. And, and most students hadn't seen this. I think at one point we, we took for granted that people were exposed to these sorts of things when they were, when they were younger. Um, I think probably the fact that people no longer study the humanities means that they, they, they don't, that might be one place where people would have been exposed to this. And that's not, that's not really generally part of most people's education nowadays. So, but John, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate the conversation. Hopefully we can continue the conversation. This book right here, Constitution of Knowledge, it really is uh, a, a remarkable book. And, and I think it's, um, it's just starting a, a larger conversation. And I think that from now on, people are going to have to talk about uh, the Constitution of Knowledge, the checks and balances that are built in, the hardware and the software elements. And I think from now on, we'll have to talk about right knowledge production as, as a social network. So I love how you wove in terms like you know, social network and the operating system of, of the knowledge world. I love that term. Um, thanks so much, John. Appreciate it. This is Unsiloed brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.